the Naples Council on uh, World Affairs uh, uh, welcomes Mead Treadwell. Now, as most of you know, an awful lot of our speakers uh, talk about individual co countries. So we get China, we get Russia. I thought two weeks ago we had a really good one uh, talking about Mexico. But some of our speakers talk about topics that touch a lot of different countries. And I am particularly attracted to those kinds of topics, and that's the kind of topic uh, we've got tonight. Uh, eight countries uh, border the Arctic, and a whale of a lot more than that are interested in what's going on there, and things are changing. So we've got a fantastic uh, topic. Uh, our speaker, you know, you can read on the screen about him. Uh, from that, you can uh, discern that he's a politician, uh, that he knows a lot about the Arctic. Uh, he's a policy guy. Uh, you can look at his picture. You know he's from Alaska, so, you know, he's got that kind of that rugged outdoor uh, individual type. And, you know, I think he's all of those things. Uh, but he's a lot more than that. Uh, he's a very experienced entrepreneur. As, uh, he co-founded two companies that are now tr uh, publicly traded, very successful uh, companies. He's had lots of management uh, jobs, both in the government and in the private uh, sector. Uh, he is a finance guy. He's invested in a lot of companies, and he's helped a lot of other people invest uh, their money in, in, in you know, a lot of uh, ventures. Uh, he was a political correspondent. Uh, for uh, an Alaska newspaper. Uh, he's from Connecticut, was born and raised <laughs> in Connecticut. Uh, he's uh, got a bachelor's degree from Yale, a business degree uh, from Harvard. Uh, he was a Senate page. Uh, his mother lives in Fort Lauderdale. The family <laughs> has owned property on Sanibel for a long time, and that's where he met his wife. So this is a very diverse person who knows a lot about the topic. Please help me welcome Mead Treadwell. Well, uh, General, thank you uh, for that introduction. Greg, thank you for, for the introduction. Mimi, uh, thank you. Uh, Mimi was my interlocutor. I was here about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, uh, then you came to Alaska uh, with a group of other uh, World Affairs Council executives, and uh, I'm honored to be back. I was talking to a fellow who works on Arctic policy at the White House the other day, and I said, I'm going to give a talk on Arctic policy in Naples. And he said, gosh, I wish we could come to, Arctic, uh, to Naples to talk about Arctic policy. But uh, uh, at any rate... Uh, this afternoon, what I'd like to do is take you through what's happening in the Arctic. And I'm going to ask this very simple question. So let's go to the first slide there. Uh, how many times in history does the world give you a new ocean? All right? The Atlantic, you have to go back to Columbus time. The Mediterranean before that. The Pacific with Magellan 500 years ago. In our lifetimes, an ocean which was thought to be inaccessible, an ocean that was really only used by submarines for cat and mouse, an ocean that has been, in essence, unchanged for 10,000 years as sea hunters, whether they are people who eat whales or seals or fish, uh, worked around the margins, all of a sudden, this ocean is much more accessible with much less ice. So it's not only physically accessible, it's accessible to global affairs, and boy, are there a whole lot of things in global affairs, and it's, it's accessible to commerce. So I'm going to try to take you through that today. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of the Sisex expedition. If you're listening on the radio, it's simply a great big piece of flat pancake ice that goes for miles. And you haven't lived until you fly 200 miles north of Alaska. You can't even see Russia from that part of your house. Um, and 
and you're standing, uh, your, your little airplane lands, and then you get into a helicopter, and you go 30 or 40 miles, and there's a big X painted on the ice. And pretty soon, the firmament or whatever it is beneath you begins to rumble, and the biggest, baddest U.S. nuclear attack submarine comes up through the ice right then, and then you spend about uh, three hours with a chainsaw trying to get uh, enough ice out of the way to go down the hatch. Uh, that exercise will again happen next month, or I'm, I'm sorry, in February, and uh, uh, they've moved it up. This, this picture was taken on a St. Patrick's Day. Uh, the Coast Guard was kind enough to drop us some beer. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, the fact is, is that the Arctic is a place where uh, there is a lot of military activity and there's likely going to be more. Let's go to the next slide for a second. It's a picture of Peter Freuken and his third wife, uh, Dagmar, in 1947. But just to show that people haven't given up wearing fur coats like Peter Freuken, my daughter, uh, Natalie, is uh, next to the Arctic Inuksuk in our front yard on, the, uh, on Cook Inlet, and she's wearing my fur coat. So there you go. Uh, next, next slide is a picture by Fred Makatantz, uh, who is an artist originally from Ohio, who uh, lived in Alaska, was one of the best known uh, artists in Alaska, and a quote from Shakespeare, it doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. So let's go to a map, and if you're not uh, uh, online watching, watching this, uh, it's a map of the Arctic looking straight down at the North Pole. And as uh, was mentioned, there are eight Arctic nations around the Arctic Circle. Uh, the Arctic Circle is about 66 degrees. Legally, we in the United States have said the Arctic comes down further really to the Aleutian Islands in terms of all the kinds of things we do in the Arctic. Um, and uh, it's a very, very close neighborhood. Uh, you know, the Sea Russia from your house line is a joke. It's a great throwaway. But the, the, the fact is, is that I can be in Russia faster than I can be in Seattle where I live in Anchorage, all right? I can be in Iceland faster than I could be in Minneapolis. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a tremendously close part of the world that when you come into foreign affairs, what is Europe and what is Asia and what is North America is all the same neighborhood. And that itself has lots of implications for, for public affairs. Let's go to the next slide. There's four to five things that we do in the Arctic, six things rather, that I like to say we do in common. We help feed the world. We have two of the world's richest fisheries, the Barents Sea and the Bering Sea, North Pacific. And whether you're eating fresh cod, and uh, I passed a couple of restaurants that were serving Alaskan cod last night, um, or, or fresh salmon, uh, those oceans are incredibly important, and climate change and the effect on those oceans is incredibly important as, uh, as uh, uh, you see uh, freshening change, as you see acidity change, and we've got to pay very close attention to that. So the Arctic is important there. We help fuel the world. At one point, Alaska produced 25% of the oil produced in the United States before the fracking revolution. Uh, but we also... Uh, Iceland is probably the world's leader in applying geothermal technology. Uh, hydro technology coming out of the north of Canada uh, powers much of New England. It's huge and it's, uh, it's significant. And we're also a test bed for many new technologies. So the Arctic feeds the world, fuels the world. We help provision the world. The largest lead zinc mine in the world is, or in, in North America for sure, is uh, Red Dog in northwest Alaska, high in the Arctic. So high in the ice that when they built it, they didn't think they could serve it all year, and so uh, they have the largest warehouse under the American flag to store all that zinc all year, and then they load it up at the end of the summer. The largest nickel mine in the world is in northern Russia. My friend, an Alaskan-Canadian, Ron Sheardown, uh, discovered, helped discover the Mary River Project on Baffin Island near Greenland in Canada, which is the largest iron ore mine in the world. And because that went in in the last decade, that mine ships 365 days a year. So we helped provision the world. We helped uh, protect the world. 
And whether it's missile defense at Fort Greeley or the largest logistics base, the largest collection of fighters in, in Alaska, whether it's the radar at Thule in Greenland, uh, whether it's our alliances in Norway, uh, we have a, a fascinating situation. An American submarine commander told me at one point, I've added on more ICE pilot, uh, pilots simply because we want to be able to move our submarines between oceans without anybody knowing and not having to show the whole world in the Panama Canal. We have a, a, a logistics space in Alaska that is as forward deployed and as close to Europe as it might be to Asia. So we help protect the world. We help connect the world. I like to say that uh, with the two biggest Air, car, uh, our air cargo firms in the United States, uh, FedEx and UPS, their second largest hubs in the world are in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and uh, if I buy an iPhone that comes up from Seattle, it's already been to Anchorage once. It flew, in, it flew through before it went to the distribution point down in California. Uh, the interesting thing about this is why are we the biggest air hub in the, in the Northern Hemisphere and it comes down not just to geography, but to reliability. And this is actually a, a kind of a, one of these crossroads between uh, foreign policy and, and commerce. Russia didn't want overflights during the Cold War. We went for an entire century, practically, with Eurasia saying we don't want to be part of the global transportation system. And so there's no roads across Russia of significance. The one railroad across Russia never really got into global commerce the way you might have expected. And Alaska captured the global aviation market. Novosibirsk is just a good place to get gas, but we want it. And we want it with reliability, and you'll hear me talk about shipping in a bit, because if we're going to play a role in, our, in, in shipping in the Arctic, reliability is job one. And relying on Russia to be a monopoly player in the Arctic doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we feed the world, fuel the world, protect the world, connect the world, and I like to think we inspire the world. It's a beautiful place. It's fantastic biodiversity, great wildlife, an amazing set of indigenous people who have lived there for 10,000 years and are incredibly inventive. Sunglasses, invented in Alaska. Kayak, invented in Alaska. That blanket toss came long before the trampoline. And we've been a place where people have lived and endured for a long time, and we want to make sure that we do this right. So in the next slide, we ask that question, what is driving change in the Arctic today? And it really comes down to three things. The climate is definitely changing. Technology is changing. And global demand is changing. And so the premise for my talk today very simply is this. Let's go to the next slide. Is that U.S. Arctic policy must, and there's a constant review of U.S. Arctic policy. The last time we published a document, it was signed out by George Bush in 2009, just before he left office. That's 10 years ago. Uh, before that, the, it was 1991 that the U.S. adopted an Arctic policy. And it's possible that this president will yet review an Arctic policy, and I'll tell you, because I've been involved heavily in the last two, they have to be bipartisan documents. They have to be documents that that will work. I remember briefing uh, Mrs. Clinton before she took office uh, as Secretary of State about this policy saying, even though it's signed by a Republican, we need to implement it, generally. And we worked very, very hard in that. And I would make the argument today that if we review U.S. Arctic policy, we've got to make sure that we continue to protect people, people's needs, and nature. That's a phrase that my mentor, Wally Hickel, who had been Secretary of Interior and Governor of Alaska, uh, contributed to us. I think we have to be real about the role of the Arctic in the U.S. economy and enhance that role. It is so easy for a voter someplace else to say, yeah, yeah, the Sierra Club says that's great. Shut down oil drilling. Don't do this. And nobody asked the people who live there. Right before Barack Obama left office, and you can love oil drilling or hate it, but right before he did it, he took a trillion dollars worth of resources off the table, he thought permanently, we'll see, um, 
and there wasn't a tweet, there wasn't a phone call to the governor, there wasn't a public hearing, there wasn't a discussion. The only discussion was with Canada that did the same thing, and my friend Bob McLeod, who just stepped down as premier of the Northwest Territories, put out a red alert saying you can't do this because here's the thing that you have to remember. There's only 4 million people who live in the Arctic. You know, that's less than the size of uh, Miami for sure. And, and, and the fact is, is that they don't have enough cash stuffed in their mattresses to do the investments that are needed to provide that food and that fuel and that transportation and so forth. So we're always out there trying to raise money. Sounds like Yale. Um, but, uh, but, the point, but the point I'm getting at here is that, is that we've got to be competitive. And government policy has to realize that the Arctic is part of our economy as well as part of our environment. Uh, we need to leverage military and civil needs to get the infrastructure we need. You'll hear, and I'll show a slide in a moment, that shows that Russia's got probably 40 times as much icebreaking capacity as we do. Why? Because they've done it for their economy as well as for their security. And I'm working on a new project on that that could do that. I suggest that we keep Russia from maintaining a monopoly on Arctic shipping. Now, we could talk all day about that, but they're kind of like a troll under the bridge in this. You can't go across the top of Europe without a Russian icebreaker escort, whether you need it or not. And the price for your boat, a uh, regular size container ship, will be about $500,000. Now, that, some people could say that's immoral taxation. Uh, they had wars in the Baltic about that. Uh, but the point, the point is this, it's not in our interest, it's not in Japan's interest, it's not in Korea's interest, it's not in China's interest, it's not in Canada's interest to see one nation control shipping in the north. And so my argument uh, today is that we have to think about what we can do to contribute to reliability and maintain free shipping. And that I don't think we've looked hard enough at in Arctic policy in the past. We have to contain China's efforts to expand its geopolitical influence in the region. And this is a place where the earlier policy argument of being real uh, needs to come apply. Because when I talk about all those fish we catch, or those minerals we sell, or those transportation of iPhones that we bring through the north to you, uh, most of it is either taking something from China or taking something to China. And so, on the one hand, you don't want China to control things in the Arctic. And on the other hand, we do want Chinese markets in the Arctic. We do want Chinese investment. We want global investment in the Arctic. And so, when you heard Secretary Pompeo say last May at the Arctic Council that China sh should not consider itself a near-Arctic nation, consider the ambivalence that I had last month, a uh, month before last, in October in China, where I'm explaining that Alaska natural gas is the second closest natural gas supply to China that they could find. You're not a near-Arctic nation, but buy our close gas. I think the point is this, is that like the Monroe Doctrine, uh, we're saying let the Arctic people take care of Arctic security affairs and let's tr trade heavily in global markets. Finally, uh, I, I say here, I, you know, I, I had considered putting on this slide to, uh, buy Greenland or don't buy Greenland, but uh, I am going to say this. this uh, I, ha I had a dinner this summer in Juneau, Alaska. We had all the world's sovereign wealth funds there uh, visiting, and uh, the investment minister of Greenland, who's a, a, a good friend, uh, was in Juneau to talk to that group, and so I flew into Juneau, and we had a dinner. And I brought along a senior State Department official, and I said, okay, I guess I'm here to help, help uh, negotiate a purchase. But, the, but the, the fact is this, Greenland, of course, is not for sale. But this is what you have, also have to remember about the Arctic. In the same way that African colonies were decolonized by the Europeans, in the same way that uh, Alaska went from being a territory of the United States to a self-governing state, Greenland has negotiated a home rule agreement and terms for independence with Denmark. And guess what? Denmark has said, you can be an independent country, you 60,000 people on this giant island. 
if you can come up with a replacement for the half billion dollars a year so, or, or, or so a year subsidy that our government gives your government to run its affairs. So Greenland's not for sale, but I can tell you we do need to develop a close relationship with Greenland. When you, when you fly from North America to Europe, you're paying overflight fees over Canada and Iceland, and Greenland is kind of ignored, even though you spend more of your trip over Greenland. We should be dropping pennies from heaven there, too. Uh, when, uh, when I was at an investment conference in Greenland, they laid out their plan to build two new runways to bring in tourism and help build their economy. And I was sitting right next to a Chinese private equity guy, and they put up the money. And the U.S. threw a fit. And uh, we, got, we got Denmark to come and make that investment together. But the point, the, the point is this, is that officially in foreign affairs, Denmark speaks for Greenland. But in actuality, what you've got is you've got, a, you've got a close cadre of people who want to be involved in the opportunities of the Arctic. They want to make things happen. And I think we have to have a policy that works with respect. I'm going to shift now forward two slides and uh, just show you a quick movie, if you can, that just shows what's been happening on this ocean. And this is, this is a chart that looks at uh, receding Arctic sea ice. And it goes for a couple of minutes, but let's just talk about what's happening here. You'll be able to see that in the, uh, in the spring months, ice builds up. In the summer months, ice moves back. And here are some things to remember. In 2007, most of the multi-year ice went out of the Arctic Ocean. It all sailed past the Fram Strait and went into the Atlantic Ocean, didn't sink any Titanics, just simply melted, all right? We still have ice in the winter. Uh, it still gets to be several feet thick, but it's much more navigable ice. It's made up mostly of salt water, which is easier to break if you're taking an icebreaker through it, rather than fresh water, which is much harder ice. So that's a change. Another change you might notice as you watch this ice wax and wane is that Overall, there's less white reflectivity at the top of the Earth. Why should we care about that? We should care about that because when it's white, it's reflecting solar radiation back into space and helps cool the Earth. When it's dark, it's absorbing heat in the ocean and helping expand the size of the ocean. And it's not just melting ice, but actually expanding molecules with a warmer ocean that's uh, the threat that they talk about with sea level rise. Another thing that is happening right there in the Arctic as you look at these physical processes is there's more and more fresh water flowing out of the northern tundra into the Arctic Ocean, so it's becoming fresher. But also it means that in that tundra, you're catching more and more methane going into the atmosphere to the point where the last time I checked the numbers, and I'm a little rusty on this one, the amount of methane that we were pumping naturally out of the tundra into the atmosphere had a greater greenhouse impact than all the cars, trucks, trains, planes, power plants in the western United States. And so, as you look at the Arctic, look at this, uh, you can look at it as a tragedy, you can look at it as an opportunity. I can make arguments for both. You can look at it as something that you'd like to see. And uh, when I was chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, we pulled scientists together, and it was very hard to see any scenario that brings back the multi-year sea ice in the next 50 to 200 years. But what it does mean is that we do have an accessible ocean, and we need to do it properly. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the potential economic issues in the Arctic, opportunities in the Arctic, some of the people issues and some of the nature issues, and then close with policy. The diminishing, uh, the global demand for natural resources is strong. What's, what's happening here is, is this. We want to sell more natural gas as a country. Why? Because where we're selling it, we're replacing coal-burning power plants. So uh, it's, I, I, I don't feel guilty trying to bring Alaska natural gas to Asia, for example. 
Uh, there's a continued demand for crude oil, and I still believe we ought to be producing crude oil in places that are geopolitically safe rather than places that are geopolitically risky. And there's increasing dependence on rare earth minerals and other, uh, and, and, and other minerals. In this iPhone here, uh, you have several uh, rare earth minerals that are only mined and refined in China. And when Greenland comes up with opportunities or when Alaska comes up with opportunities, the dirty little secret is that we kind of like the Chinese monopoly prices because they help you finance your mine faster. But we really do need diversity of supply for rare earth minerals. There's also a gold rush going on quite quietly right now for cobalt, nickel, zinc, graphite, and other minerals that will go into electric car batteries and storage devices. In fact, you'll find most of those in many of the best prospects in the Arctic. So that's happening there. The next slide is a set of maps developed by the U.S. Geological Survey also in the first decade of this, uh, 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 in the first decade there, that actually helped Greenland in its negotiations with Denmark say, look, we've got a lot of oil potential. That's going to help us stand on our own as a country. Next slide. The mineral potential uh, I've already mentioned is significant. And next slide. In terms of technology innovations, we're seeing that the Arctic is the test bed to bring high-speed broadband to the north and to the world. Uh, it's uh, the best place where we end up testing new te uh, techniques for mapping and remote sensing, for cold weather drilling techniques, and for renewable energy systems. And I'm pretty proud of the fact that we're a test bed here. There's just one example of the next one of the icebreakers today that are going through the Arctic. If we go to the next slide, you're seeing new technology with uh, LNG carriers. I mentioned LNG, and we'll uh, get back to that again. But this is the LNG carrier that uh, there were 13 of them built, uh, 14 of them built for the new Yamal project in Russia. And one of them is uh, uh, named the Christoph de Marjorie, was the first. That ship has a V-shaped bow to work in heavy seas and a spoon-shaped stern to work in ice and propulsion that is 360 degree azipods under the under the the icebreaker what it means is that there's almost no area on earth that is not accessible now where it might have been accessible inaccessible before and that today's icebreaker is about 35 percent more efficient than they used to be all right, we've talked about resources, we've talked about technology. Let's go back to nature. That's very, very important. Next slide. Uh, you know that uh, I've mentioned food security already and how important the food in the environment is to the people who live in the Arctic. Uh, the health of the polar bear, the health of the seal population, the health of the walrus population, the health of the bowhead whale population, all is directly related to the physical and mental health of the people who live in the Arctic. And we're not going to give that up. When I announced this new company, which we'll talk about to, to, to bring liquefied natural gas from Alaska to Asia, I said the first tenant of our company is food security. And if you go to the next slide, there have been changes a lot lately. There have been changes in plant productivity. There's been species shipping, uh, shifting northward. We've seen marine, marine mammal species uh, uh, Mimi talked in the opening slide about uh, polar bear coming ashore in Russian cities. Uh, we, have, we have situations where the effects of the changes on wildlife or the change that you've seen in the Arctic are, are quite significant. And there's greater interaction between humans and animals. Uh, there's a satellite image in the next slide that shows beaver dams moving north. Moose browse is moving north to the point where moose may be displacing caribou in the Arctic tundra. And so this is something that we watch very, very carefully in research. We managed very, very carefully when I was at the state of Alaska and, and, and uh, so forth. But it's something to be very, very careful as the Arctic changes. Let me go next slide to people. In fact, you can skip the next slide and go, go to the slide after that. You have people who depend on, imagine that all your foundations were based on building in permafrost and then the permafrost starts to melt. Imagine that your community was built on the shore of an ocean that was protected by a natural breakwater of ice rubble 
most of the year and then no ice comes. Imagine that your community is, and it's there because you want to be able to, I, I mean, I've been in Kivalina, Alaska, where somebody might be grading the airport and look out and see a beluga whale go by and go, he didn't, maybe he said to himself, lunch. But what he said was dinner for everybody in the community, and they roused four or five guys out and went and took that beluga whale. And that was, that was a major, uh, probably uh, covered uh, food needs of the community for over a week. And the point, uh, the, the point I'm getting at here is that of the people who live in the Arctic, you not only have this dependence, but you have these changes coming. If you go as a tourist and your cruise ship takes you to land near Barrow, you might suggest to the cruise ship company that you know maybe you ought to tell the people at Barrow you're about to unload 400 people in their 2,000 person town. Uh, there, there are you know stories like that that are just uh, kind of getting there. Next slide. We have a challenge at Barrow right now in Udiagvik in that they still hope to land a whale as the season wanes and the ice comes in. So that's, that's what we have to be very careful of. Whatever we do in policy, we need to be careful of the people. And I can tell you story after story on language preservation, on preservation of culture. Uh, and I have to say that I think Alaskans are, gonna, are doing fairly well. I think Canadians are doing fairly well. Uh, I'm, I'm frankly personally upset with the absence of interaction that, that the Putin government has allowed for indigenous people around the Arctic, they actually tried to disband the, uh, the uh, Ar Arctic indigenous peoples or the Russian Arctic indigenous peoples group and, the, and cut out outside interference. We've had a whole lot of interaction across the border uh, where our whale people and their whale people work together and our polar bear people and their polar bear people work together. And that's been a little bit harder under the Putin regime than it was with, uh, with Yeltsin. So anyway, we've talked about the environment, we've talked about people, let's go to the North Slope uh, of Russia. So uh, in terms of commercial opportunities in the North, tomorrow at the Wilson Center, uh, Scott Minard, who oversees the, uh, oversees the $240, $250 billion Guggenheim Investment Group, former president of Iceland, Grimson, and I will announce a new inventory assessment for the Arctic. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at what is the infrastructure that we need there from flush plumbing and wastewater in certain communities to better power in certain communities. And the answer is going to be, the last time we looked at it at the World Economic Forum, it was about a trillion dollars. And we'll see what our next assessment goes. Let's go two slides next. Should be a picture of Vladimir Putin. I grew up like everybody else in the Cold War, hoping that a leader in Russia wouldn't be pushing a, red, a big red button. Uh, this big red button that he was pushing was to unleash a huge amount of new LNG upon the world. Let's go to the next slide. There's a satellite picture taken of the Port of Sabetta in spring 2011. You can see it was basically wild land. Next slide. Summers 2016, you can see quite a bit of development. Most of those modules came north through the Bering Strait and were hauled across the top of Russia to next slide. Uh, here's a picture of Sabeta in 2019. This particular project is shipping 16 and a half million tons of liquefied natural gas across the Arctic Ocean right now through the Bering Straits to markets in East Asia. And I said to my counterpart, who was the governor of Yamal, congratulations, and as your tankers go by, I hope you wave. But if you do this, thumb your nose, I don't blame you, because you beat us to the market. Next slide. You beat us to the market from 2,600 miles further to the edge, edge of the ice than Alaska that's been trying to build a pipeline instead. So uh, with a... With a uh, an option for some gas owned at uh, the Point Thompson Field uh, by Exxon, a company that I helped, a deal that I've helped put together, has announced recently that we're going to try to do that from Alaska. Well, we're trying to put four million tons on the marketplace with one tanker every six days. The Russians right now have 16 and a half million tons on the marketplace and announced commitments from Japan and Korea to turn that into 45 million tons from a much greater distance. That will mean uh, 
that will mean uh, uh, several tankers a day going across the Arctic Ocean through the Bering Straits. It will be a huge new source of cash flow for Russia. And the geopolitical aspect of this is this. If you were watching the NATO meetings last year, President Trump was chewing out the Germans for buying so much Yamal gas uh, and not making a contribution to NATO while they're helping the Russian threat. Well, you know, it's been fun to talk to Japanese politicians, I know, to say, you know, you really ought to help the North American, uh, the North American province get going uh, because uh, this, uh, this gas uh, is otherwise going to come from Russia as well. So the impact of that is, is, is very simple. I think we do have a role in Arctic shipping. I do think this project will give us a presence in the Arctic. And I am actually very excited that much of it will be used to replace coal-burning power plants in places as far away as the Philippines. Tomorrow morning, or tomorrow morning in Washington, I've got a meeting with our delegation, but if you're from Rhode Island, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse has been a sponsor, Maine, Senator King has been a sponsor, uh, Roger Wicker from Mississippi, uh, Maria Cantwell from Washington, or the co-chairs of the Commerce Committee, and there's a markup in the Commerce Committee tomorrow on a bill that would help us uh, improve our uh, icebreaker capability in the Arctic. And this one is called the SEAL Act. We may have a, a, a slightly different version of the bill to write a business plan for the SEAL Act, but think about it this way. You've got a brand new ocean. You don't want Russia to be the monopoly. You want to internationalize this ocean and make sure that there's the marine safety because the world can show up without marine safety. And we've been struggling to find money to build our icebreakers. The Coast Guard's price tag for them is about a billion dollars a piece. The private ones built in the United States can be low as three or four hundred million dollars a piece. The private ones built in Europe and in Asia can be low as 150 million dollars a piece. But I've been talking quite a bit with the insurance industry and what if we can get the insurance industry to mandate use of a service that has an icebreaker while you're shipping in the Arctic? And if that happens, you don't need to have a law to force people to use it. The insurance industry has made that a requirement in the same way that boiler insurance does a better job of regulating boilers than government does, in my opinion. And the point, the, the point here is that we're asking Congress to kind of set up a process to be able to have a funding stream to pay for icebreakers. So that's likely to come along. Let me just put it this way. A question that's very often asked is, why is the United States not a member of the Law of the Sea Treaty? I can't exactly tell you why we're not a member of the Law of the Sea Treaty, except to say that the arguments for being in it in the Arctic are very strong. It certainly gave us a 200 mile limit that helped us protect our fish. It, uh, it has given us a, a method with the International Maritime Organization, MARPOL, that have helped protect our coasts and helped protect the safety and lives of seafarers. What it also does is it's given us a chance to make a claim uh, for land in the Arctic Ocean outside the 200 mile limit where you still have continental shelf. And there's kind of a squabble going on between Russia uh, and uh, Canada and uh, Denmark over who owns the area right around the North Pole. We actually benefit if Russia wins that squabble, but that's a long story. Um, <laughs> There's a number of other disputed boundaries in the Arctic. I don't think we're going to go to war over them, but they are uh, becoming more and more inconvenient. They're becoming inconvenient on who regulates shipping, who regulates fishing, and how we, how we cooperate in terms of developing shipping. Next slide. One of the questions is, does this new ocean destabilize the cooperative geopolitical framework that developed in the Coast War period? Is there a power imbalance? Well. Look at this chart to see who owns how many icebreakers. The United States has got one and a half. Russia's got a bunch. I've always equated the Arctic to that cabin that you and your brothers or sisters might have owned that your parents left you in the North Woods. One of you went to the big city to make some money and the other stayed in the town near the cabin. And you both own the cabin, but who do you think makes the decisions? about what happens at the cabin, all right? We don't have a presence in the Arctic and Russia does. We don't have a system to facilitate shipping in the Arctic and Russia does. 
We don't have a system of search and rescue bases. Our Coast Guard is 800 miles from the Arctic Ocean. As Lieutenant Governor of Alaska, I had to help them find ways to lease hangars to be able to do forward basing when Shell was doing its exploration. It's time now for America to have a much stronger presence in the Arctic. And just counting on you as taxpayers to write a check isn't going to work. It's playing in the economy of the world as that happens. So with things like the SEAL Act, with things like starting icebreakers, with things like moving forward with LNG, and things like we are doing at the Arctic Council to help work together to protect wildlife, I think we've got the opportunity to do that. Next slide shows all the places that Russia has now got military bases on the Arctic coast. And some of them are brand new. Now, I'm not expecting an attack by the Russians anytime soon, but here's what I think we have to be careful of as a country. You're seeing NATO politics and Arctic politics come closer together in Europe purely and simply because Russia's made it fairly clear they'd love to have its Baltic quote-unquote old possessions back. You have Baltic nations that have decided, you know, that being part of those exercises is pretty important to be, be careful about. On our side, we're not expecting, and we've got plenty of, you know, we got more fighter jets than the rest of the country combined. I'm not really worried about I don't know, a, 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 a Russian attack on American soil. But what I am worried about is if we allow the reliance for Arctic shipping and for so much of the world's energy to be dependent on a nation that has shown a propensity to turn off the tap to extort nations in Eastern Europe. And if they've done it there, they could do it in the Pacific. And right now it's a huge opportunity to get these nations dependent. And I don't think it's right for us geopolitically to allow that to happen. So, and, and I'm somebody who has been accused of too, being too much of a Russian lover. I don't, never had any Russian lovers, but I can tell you that uh, my, my, uh, uh, I, I took my wife uh, just before we were married, my first uh, wife, my late wife in 1990, on an expedition to, to Wrangell Island in the Soviet Arctic to look at polar bears and to do some mapping for for ecotourism that was getting started. And she said, you know, honey, everybody else's, their boyfriends took them to, the, to Naples. What's going on? Uh, but but uh, I think my point is this. This is a copy of the Polar Stern. The Polar Stern is an icebreaker which is doing a mission called Mosaic. And right now, this winter, this icebreaker is freezing itself in like the Fram high in the Arctic with a group of scientists coming in and out, mostly on Russian helicopters. I'll I believe close to 30 nations are involved. And it's a very, very exciting project. Work for it. I want to make the point here that when we talk about geopolitics, we talk about economics, we talk about people, we talk about wildlife, we talk about climate change, most of what we talk about is very dependent on research. And I do hope you as taxpayers continue to support a robust Arctic research program. We've learned a lot, and we've got a lot more to learn. So let me close with the next slide to reiterate on U.S. policy. Uh, you can't be monolithic in your thinking about the Arctic. Your letters from, uh, your, your shareholders' letters from an oil company will tell you one thing, and your, share, and your membership letters from the Sierra Club will tell you something else. We have to think about people, people's needs, and nature. And we have to be democratic about what we're doing. We need to make sure that self-determination is part of the uh, job. We have to be real about the role of the Arctic in the U.S. economy. It is a huge contributor to the U.S. economy, and it will be more for many strategic things. We need to get the civil uh, system and the military system to work much better together if we're going to solve the infrastructure needs and the gaps we have in the Arctic. And those can be gaps in telecommunications, gaps in icebreakers, gaps in fueling facilities for ports, gaps in anything that is uh, required for us or the military to operate. And we have to do a much better job to work together. I just published a chapter in a new book about that. We need to keep Russia from establishing a monopoly. Russia is, uh, I, I am very proud of the cooperation that we've done with Russia on marine safety during the toughest time in U.S.-Russia relations. I 
took the ambassador for a walk in the woods one day, and I said, Mr. Ambassador, the best deep water port in northwestern Alaska is actually in Russia. Why can't we cooperate more on shipping? With so much LNG coming through, you have got people who are paying through the nose for power and heat and light, and why can't that be used to work together? And there's a number of things we can and we will do together, and we always have to do it almost under the radar because something comes along like Georgia or Crimea or Ukraine to mess it up. And it makes being in the neighborhood very, very hard when your neighbor is somebody who, who is causing so many problems other places in the world. But we do have a good relationship on search and rescue. And during the toughest time in U.S.-Russian relations, we said, okay, with all those tankers going through the Bering Strait, Let's make sure that we've got better AIS to know what the, where those tankers are, that we put up those AIS transceivers on our little seal hunters' boats, and that we make sure that we don't kill anybody while we serve the global markets. And we did that. I'm very proud of how we did that, and part of that happened at the Wilson Center. Mention China because China's very big, and I'll just repeat what I said before. There's nothing we do in the Arctic that isn't looking for a Chinese market or Chinese investment. China will play a role in development of the Arctic. It's huge. But the role is fine as an economic role, as a, as, a, as a subjugation role, it's not. And I believe what you heard the Secretary of State say last year was very similar to the Monroe Doctrine, is this is our pond. Let the Arctic be for the Arctic. Finally, I mentioned developing a close and lasting relationship with the people of Greenland, but what I really want to say is develop a close and lasting relationship with the people of the Arctic uh, of whatever race. Uh, uh, my, I, I was recently married again. I, I uh, married a woman I met on Sanibel who, uh, let's see, we got married in a small Norwegian fishing village in Alaska and then honeymooned in a small Norwegian fishing village in Norway. Um, but uh, uh, she recently gave a talk. Both of us went to China for a, for a an academic conference where I did a little bit of commercializing as well. And uh, she talked about how Anchorage, Alaska today has the most diverse zip codes in the nation. She was a public librarian in a neighborhood which had a more diverse population than any other city in North America. And uh, if you go to what might be thought of as an Eskimo village on the North Slope where I've got to go th Thursday, you may find as many Samoans, uh, Pacific Islanders, Guatemalans, uh, Puerto Ricans there as you find, uh, you won't find as many, but you'll find a significant population. And the fact is, is that the Arctic is what it has been for a long time. It's a place that draws the person trying to create a new world. Uh, and you find that diversity in Russia. You find that diversity in Northern Canada. It's a very, very exciting place to live. It has huge implications for the United States and foreign policy, has huge implications for the economy, and it has huge implications for the planet. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honor of being here today, and I'd be happy to answer questions, but uh, enthusiasm is a lot of fun. If you have questions, uh, there's a mic uh, in the aisle over here on your left and one on your right. Mark. You had mentioned that China is, you know, is the near neighbor. Uh, what type of infrastructure are they putting into the Arctic? Are they spending any money there? Yeah, so, um, so just talking about the, the little bit of debate. You had Mike Pompeo show up at the Arctic Council last spring, last May, and say, China, you can't keep saying you're a near Arctic nation for strategic purposes. We don't want to see Chinese submarines running around in that ocean. We don't want this to be, uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a region that for security purposes, we're not really looking for Chinese participation. We are, however, looking for Chinese markets. And we are, however, looking for Chinese investment. And so one example is uh, if you take a look at that giant Yamal project I showed you, most of the gas is going because China committed to go. Most of those modules were actually built in Korea. And they'll be going to Asian markets. So, of course, the Arctic is looking for markets in, in Asia. 
I talked about the big airport uh, in Anchorage, the fourth or fifth largest air cargo port in the world. Most of the cargo that goes through there now is coming from China. So does China invest in things like hangars and that sort of thing? Yeah. And was it natural for them to think about the Greenland Airport? Absolutely. Uh, but, but strategically, do you, want, do you want China controlling the airport in Greenland, maybe the one that we would have built in World War II? I don't think you do. So it's it, it, actually, as, as we chew on the next version of U.S. Arctic policy, the question of how to say you're invited but you're not going to own us is going to be a very big question. Next question from over here, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Domestically, we seem to have uh, trouble functioning as we and we the people in the preamble of the Constitution. Um, whatever happens in, in the next year, might you uh, ask uh, Secretary uh, Pompeo and, and Secretary Kerry to get together and recognize that uh, Secretary Seward was very fort, foresighted in his purchase of Alaska and maybe form some bipartisan commission for our Arctic policy? Well, I, I, I get from your question a number of things. Uh, um, I, I have spent a bunch of time with John Kerry, sometimes being lectured by John Kerry when I was in the Bush administration about Bush not supporting law of the sea, and I never saw him send it up when he was Secretary of State. But uh, uh, I, I think the point is that for American foreign policy, we want the Arctic to be a peaceful zone. We know we can't not address climate. In fact, a question was asked this afternoon about does this administration know or care about climate? If you look at the transcripts, uh, the, the last one was a little bizarre, but the very first meeting, the president of the United States, the current president, and the president of uh, uh, Finland had was to talk about short-term forces of climate change and how we can help solve that under the Finnish chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So you do have, and, and I was with John Kerry in October, and he's very, very uh, much of the opinion that we need to do much more on climate change. I disagree with him on on uh, how he would go about it, but I do agree that it needs to be addressed, and I do agree that it can be addressed while protecting our freedom and protecting our economy. Next question over here, please. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned UNESCO, and you also mentioned China. I just read recently China considers the route through the Arctic as part of their marine belt and road, but also, um, you know, long ago, as you pointed out, uh, under President Reagan, he tried to get a Republican Senate to agree with us joining uh, UNESCO. It seems to me, as you seem to think, I think, that UNESCO... Uh, um, UNSCO... It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's unclosed, yeah, not UNESCO. That UNSCO That's should be... Uh, we should join UNSCO and um, use that vehicle to define the regions of interest to each of the bordering countries. Is that in your view, too? So uh, I, I will tell you, I've, the only other club I wanted to be a member of besides the Explorers Club was the U.S. Senate. And I had an opponent who beat me up pretty badly because I said what you just said. Uh, and then I turned to the opponent between us in the debate and said, well, you were Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, uh, didn't you support this treaty? He goes, don't throw me in that briar patch. But I guess the point I'm getting at is this. The treaty has one flaw that, on principle, I agree with is a flaw. The flaw is that outside the 200-mile limit, in the area that's owned by all of us, we collect a royalty on any minerals found there and distribute them to the people of the, the countries of the Earth uh, together. And conservative opposition to the law of the sea is basically over that clause. It's the first global tax. It's the first really global uh, governance that, that, you know, exacts a tax, even if it's a specialized one. And, and there's others who may argue with me. But the point, the, the point I'm getting at is it's that particular thing. It's not the, the issue of should we or should we not go for land outside the Arctic. The United States t stands to gain territory twice the size of California, most of it in the Arctic and off Alaska, because of the law of the sea. People don't remember that it was Richard Nixon who called the law of the sea treaty together, hired people like Elliot Richardson, John Norton Moore, because why? Because foreign fishermen were stealing all our fish. 
So we got the right things in the treaty. We actually abide by the treaty, but we won't ratify the treaty because the last, uh, I, the story's way too long, but uh, there was a group of 77 nations who said, the ocean's the common heritage of mankind, where's our peace? And they gave them this royalty distribution. And that was the argument that Jesse Helms and many others have, have had. And the last chance the treaty had was, uh, was toward the end of the, uh, of the Obama administration, where I think uh, more than 40 U.S. senators signed a thing saying they wouldn't vote for it. So it's never come up. It's never been sent up. Uh, but, you know, hope springs eternal, and there's always, you could bring the countries together again and get rid of that crazy thing or give us credit if we go do maritime research or something like that. So we'll see. With that, thank you, sir. Thank you.